important, I think, anytime we're looking at starting up a cooperative enterprise, anytime, even if you're just looking at starting up a small business enterprise on your own, you need to understand the economics of what you're trying to do or what you're planning to do. And you need to have understood in detail all of the costs that are going to be associated and then have a plan for being able to cover those costs, plus, of course, money for yourself and you know and, and your coworkers in terms of wages or salaries. Um, the problem with the rideshare model is that the economics simply do not work. And Uber and Lyft have demonstrated this amply over their existence. They have lost billions of dollars a year, every year they've been in existence, um, which is far more than their executives make. So it's not a matter of just, this is high paid executives. Um, the, the model itself is basically just a taxi company. They have made a few major changes, uh, but nothing that actually changes the economics of it, uh, of just running a taxi company. Um, but it does come with a whole lot of extra costs in terms of infrastructure investment. Um, and then in the case of Uber and Lyft, having to pay off um, and you know purchase legislation essentially uh, to make their model legal in the first place. And, um, and also, you know, big massive advertising spends. So just the financials, like we look at a business and we see like on the face of it, it looks, oh, this must be successful. I'm seeing it everywhere. It's in the news. It's all this positive stuff. But when you look at, for instance, um, somebody like Hubert Haran, uh, who has written a series, an ongoing series on the, the finances and the economics of the, the rideshare industry um, on the Naked Capitalism blog for several years now. I think he's on like part 32. Highly recommend it. If you're thinking about doing this, make sure you read Hubert's articles uh, so that you can understand the economics of this big capitalist industry that we see. The reality is they're running a negative margin business, right? So every ride that Uber and Lyft gives, they lose money. Well, how can you run a business for so long doing that? You have venture capitalists with billions of dollars that they can burn. And you can tell them as the executives, look, we're going to lose money for a while, but we're going to drive all the competition out of business by underselling them. And then when we're in a monopoly position, we'll jack up rates enough and, th and that will cover our previous losses that we took, and then we'll be in the money forever thereafter. Well, the reality is it hasn't panned out like that. Um, the reality is, like I said, they've, you know, both Uber and Lyft are, are money losing. Um, they also depend on not just venture capitalists who are willing to throw endless amounts of money down a black hole, uh, but also the drivers not understanding and being and being encouraged to not understand the economics of the situation from their perspective. So as I'm sure you're aware, as a, a rideshare driver, you are responsible for all the maintenance on your vehicle. You're responsible for putting gas into it. Somebody throws up coming home from the bar in it. You're responsible for cleaning it up. You're responsible for your insurance. You're responsible for everything that if you were a cab driver, the cab company would be taken care of, right? And the reality is when you add up, when you do the math for any, like, at, you know, your standard rideshare driver, you're not really going to be making enough more than what your expenses are, kind of the hidden expenses. You know, you're not seeing your maintenance costs every day, so it's easy to kind of not think about them until you got to replace a transmission, right? Um, and so... It's dependent on people, you know, the drivers, you know, people being in kind of a desperate situation, looking for some gig work and doing this and not, you know, having had nobody explain to them, you know, if once you actually do all the math, you're probably better off like picking up some shifts at the bodega or something, um, you know, so there, there's a lot of turnover. There's massive turnover. Um, in these companies uh, on the drivers. Most drivers are not lasting more than six months because at some point it does become clear that this isn't really that great of a, a gig uh, financially. Um, but there's lots of desperate people <laughs> looking for work. And so they can have this churn 
but it's it's kind of part of the business model, right? Um, and so even with that, and again, these are money losing businesses. So even though they've offloaded all of these expenses that a normal cab company would have onto their drivers individually, they're still losing money. The question is why? Because massive technical spend, massive infrastructure spend is required to run, um, you know, any of these, uh, this sort of business with the app and everything at any kind of scale. And that um, is really expensive. Tech people don't work for cheap, right? And it, tur it turns out if you try to charge enough to cover all of your expenses, there's not enough demand. There's not enough people who can pay that much for, you know, a private car service to make it worth it. So this is kind of like the fundamental problems with the economics of it. And I'm not the only one who's pointed this out. Um, you know, you said you talked to somebody who wasn't very interested. I will point you to an article that I think now probably only exists on GEO uh, by John McNamara, who is with the Northwest Cooperative Development Center. Um, and he has an article why we it's called why we don't need a cooperative Uber. And he lays out, um, you know, these kind of things and why, you know, this is not a appropriate model or really a feasible model uh, for cooperatives. But then he does, at the end of the article, lay out what he thinks would be, you know, feasible. And one, you know, John was a former uh, driver at Union Taxi Cooperative in Madison, Wisconsin for many years. Um, so he's very familiar with the industry. And uh, he says, you know, what we would be useful is to have some co-op coordinating between the taxi co-ops that we have around the country. Uh, there's one in DC called Anytime Taxi Cooperative, for instance. There's one in uh, uh, Austin, uh, ATX Taxi Cooperative, of course, Union Cab in Madison. Um, and there's more that I'm, that are not popping at the top of my head, but I know there's some in Colorado and other places. So, um, you know, there's definitely scope for cooperativism uh, in this industry, but I think the way that it needs to go Rather than, you know, the quote unquote ride share, which I have a problem with even using that terminology because I was taught from my mother when I was a child that sharing meant you just gave something to somebody and you didn't demand money or anything else back from them. Right. So if there's money changing hands in my book, that's not sharing by definition, but whatever. <laughs> um, the, thanks for that. <laughs> the, uh, but the, yeah, the, the issue is that um, we don't need to try to recreate a cooperative version of this totally borked ride-sharing model. We have good models. We have Union Taxi. We have ATX Taxi uh, Co-op, which, by the way, in Austin, that taxi co-op started after they successfully got their city council to pass regulations that effectively kept Uber and Lyft out of the city. So Uber and Lyft what's, again. What's, which area of the country was that? I'm sorry. Austin, Texas. And so again, Uber and Lyft are dependent. Their business model, of course, was dependent on blatantly violating taxi cab regulations, blatantly violating commercial driver's license regulations, right? You have to have a passenger certification, at least in Montana, where I live, you have to have a passenger certification on your driver's license to carry people as a job, to transport people. I had to get a passenger certification when I drove the park and ride bus at my university. So their business model is dependent on people just not knowing about these regulations, violating them, violating like their insurance policies, because most people's insurance policies don't cover people that they're carrying around, driving around for money. Um, and so in Austin, they were able to get the city council to pass regulations to really enforce this stuff and crack down on it and say, you know, look, Uber, Lyft, you have to actually make sure your drivers can pass a background check and they can do all this stuff. And you have like, they have to have adequate insurance. They have to have all the stuff and Uber and Lyft said, no, well, we're just out. And, you know, thinking, ha ha, we'll show you, we'll just leave, take our ball and go home. Well, it turns out, look, we can just have a taxi co-op and we don't need you. And you, and avoiding all of the problems with, 
offloading all expenses onto individual people and expecting everybody to take care of like do the math on all their own expenses. No, no, no. That's the whole cooperative ethos is we do this together. So it's not each of us individually trying to figure out the math every month. We have one of our members that does that for everybody. Right. Very good. Um, thank you for this <laughs> impactful lesson. Absolutely. Um, it, 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 as you spoke, I understand everything that you sp spoke to. Um, though also, I've been uh, I've been doing the rideshare uh, with uh, with Lyft essentially a little bit with Uber um, through the years of, uh, of about eight years for the most part that being the case then too um, and what I've what I've come to the understanding really is I think for myself part of what I really appreciated about doing this is the interaction with people um, uh, that's what's kept in me that that's what's kept me afloat <laughs> so to speak um, to do this um, because that is what I get at. otherwise it's 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 uh, um, it's a job. Um, it's a gig. It, it, it's it, it's that. But uh, uh, the interaction with people. But thank you for this absolutely yeah. um, uh, uh, insightful lesson to understanding where it's at. Um, what I'd like to do probably is uh, uh, um, take this at, to another show at some point um, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, expand on some other ideas um, that we may have, especially since the wheel is already created with the uh, cooperative taxis that you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, anytime taxi here in, 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 in the uh, DMV area, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with as of, as of recently. Um, and so it's uh, going to continue on another conversation. Yeah. And so. Um, Josh, anything else that you want to add to it right now? I do, actually, and maybe this will be a segue into the next conversation. Um, but from reading the reports, uh, like the annual reports, public annual reports from the Drivers Cooperative in New York City, and talking to some folks who are, you know, kind of have some inside knowledge of the situation, uh, it seems like what they're having to do is move out of on-demand car service as their main line of business and into paratransit specifically. So helping, you know, mobility disabled people get around and you can get contracts from the city or the state government uh, to do that and providing some kind of regular revenue. So that's something that um, both, I know the driver's co-op and, and anytime taxi co-op are actually both like that's kind of the more lucrative uh, part of the, of the industry. So you know, thinking a little bit more kind of narrow and niche, I think might be a, a good way to go. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Also, um, uh, and again, because of, uh, of, of, of becoming familiar, familiar with um, uh, different aspects of this at this point um, is where we need to be. Um, also, I, I think it's it, it's also changing changing the mindset away from um, the, the, the this the, this ride share model, um, which clearly, as you're helping helping people understand right now, um, does not work, um, and it will not work. <laughs> it's just not it's it, it's not feasible in any way, shape, or form. Um, that being the case, then too. Um, but so uh, it, it's changing the mindsets, and I thank you very much um, for mm -hmm. helping um, people see clearer um, based on what, everything that you've just shared shared with us. Um, and, and educated us on also that being the case then too. Um, uh, Josh, um, is there anything that you want to add as far as uh, as far as Geo is concerned? Um, how people can um, uh, reach out to to to, to Geo? Um, give me some links. And so yeah. On. So yes, you can find us on uh, the web at geo.coop. That's G-E-O dot C-O-O-P. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. We have a weekly newsletter that you just kind of get everything that went up on the website that week. Um, and yeah, and if you'd like to get in contact with us, we always uh, welcome emails. You can email us at editors at geo.coop. And it's been great to be on. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sergey, for doing this. Thank you also so much, Josh. Um, I again, I totally appreciate everything that you've just brought forward to not only my mind, but to many other people's minds at this point there too. Um, and uh, on on behalf of uh, Drivers Against Genocide, um, I, I I truly do thank you at this point for uh, for bringing this further um, uh, understanding to uh, to us all. That being the case, then too, um, I'm going to end it here. Um, and. Uh, um, Josh, have a beautiful rest of your day. Um, that being the case, then too. Yeah, I mean, it, and there's a it, it, yeah, there's much more. Like obviously, I, I mean, I sat down. I'm glad I did it. I made I made a bunch of notes on my phone before this. I'm like, okay, I've been reading and thinking about this stuff and talking to people about it for a long time. So I should try to get 
get it all together. But one of the things I didn't mention was, and I haven't heard anybody talk about this, but you know, there's the argument that, well, people are already doing this work, right? Re regardless of good, bad, and different, people are doing it. So why not have a cooperative version? Cooperative version is always going to be better than whatever else, even if it's super, you know, flawed or whatever. And 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 so like I was crunching some of the numbers in the drivers co-op annual report and pointing out like it looks like drivers are getting like one or two rides a day, maybe like on average, if you just like average out the numbers, right? The you know, total total rides given this year divided by the number of drivers times, you know however many 300 days a year or something and uh, yeah and it was very very small and what people who are like kind of so trying to be super you know supportive of the drivers co-op uh were saying was like well yeah that's true but you know they're because everybody's also working for uber and lyft at the same time they're driving for drivers co-op and so it's like, well, at least it's like supplementing their incomes with they get because they get better wages when they take drive rides from drivers co-op. And my thought is, you know, my comment on that was like, yeah, but isn't it maybe the case that they would totally get out of the ride sharing industry if, you know, if it wasn't for the little extra money that they get from the drivers co-op, right? It might be that like the little, it, we might just be kind of subsidizing them to keep working for Uber and Lyft as well. Um and so anyway, I mean, that's a, it's, it's kind of a, wow. a subtle point, but it's like, no, I, that's, you know, that's impactful. I, 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 I totally appreciate it and see, see what you're bringing forward in my mind's eye. Um, yeah, this, there, there's a lot to this. Um, I, I, I think also it's, it's interesting though too, and in, in, in part, just because of what you just said though too, it, it really brings me back to the idea that, um, you know, the infrastructure in this country with regard to mass transit systems, so on and so forth is abysmal. Um, compared yeah. to other parts of the world. Um, and if we just, you know, if it wasn't for the robber barons um, from the last century through through to today um, that make it make it so that the mass transit systems are just not even viable, um, mm -hmm. not that they couldn't be, but that, that they aren't. Um, uh, it, it's, yeah. mass, it's a mass restructuring. It's a mass restructuring of, of how humans live on this earth um, in, in, in city dwellings, so on and so forth. All of it needs to be rethought. Um, the well, whole thing. Have you ever have you ever spent any time in like Southeast Asia, any place like that, more kind of third world spots? Um, only only three years ago, I was uh, for the first time um, in Bangladesh. Oh, nice. So yeah, I haven't I haven't been there, but I've been to Nepal a lot, and that um, very yeah similar. And uh, I would imagine, and I, what they do in Nepal, which I think like, why don't we do this here? I mean, they have everything is public transit. It's not public. I mean, it's private, privately owned, right? But they're not doing cabs. Like there are cabs, but those are mostly just for the tourists. It's micro buses, minivans. You know that it's it's kind of like it's not the rideshare thing. It's like me and my friends are starting a bus company, but there's like no hoops to jump through. Right. There's like it's very minimal, like it's easy, like you just buy the bus, you get your license, you have to go like whatever, pay your taxes every year. Um, but so as a result, there's just a ton of buses and micro buses and vans like going everywhere. Like no, like you don't have to own uh, own anything. And also, you know, their government is completely uh, just dysfunctional. So there's no public <laughs> investment but they managed to get around that, you know, anyway. And it's it's chaotic and it's, you know, far from perfect, but it's like, man, I would rather have this system, you know, going, especially out here in rural Montana where I'm at. It's like, yeah, public transit. <laughs> I we, we have a van that goes, the public van that drives into, you know, town once a week. So like, wow, that's, that's it. <laughs> that, that's really eye-opening though, too. Thanks for even for helping me understand that too. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Most of my most of my travels have been outside of the U.S. Um, very little with inside the structure of the U.S. Um, and so when I'm hearing, don't blame you. When I'm hearing, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, when I'm hearing things like this, it's it's uh, it, it's eye opening to to understand, and uh, yeah, it yeah. makes a lot of sense for us though too. But yeah, yeah. it's, it's you know it, it's it, it's unfortunate. Um, the the mass transit here in the D.C. area, kind of the north, the, the, what I've seen, at least to my understanding, is that the northeast corridor of the United States at least has this 
mass transit system as antiquated as it is. Um, it's, 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 it's as functional as it can be. Um, and it's a lot more than you just helped me understand in other parts of the country at this point, too, which is a shame. Uh, oh, yeah. Again, for you know, for what the, 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 only, the only purpose is that uh, uh, that 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 it had not to do anything was to um, was so that the rich got richer um, and, <laughs> and the rest of us are scrambling trying to figure out ways of of, of how to of how to get to our jobs, um, et cetera, et cetera, on uh, on uh, you know on 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 below living wages um, most of the time. Mm-hmm.